Hello, today I wanted to bring to you a great find um, and it's just in time for Easter 2024. This is an account of God's healing documented in our generation. And this, it's an account about Barbara Snyder who was healed from multiple sclerosis. And um, so this website documented very well um, and it has the testimony from her doctor right here but i will just i want to focus on here first the background is that barbara had a very severe case of multiple sclerosis it was predicted that she would die soon she would was blind bedridden with severely impaired breathing due to a paralyzed diaphragm and a collapsed lung bladder and stomach control were lost you can read more about what her physician Thomas Marshall wrote on that website and he even wrote a book about it. However, we'll skip that part and go to her account of, to her account of her healing. It was a day like any other day for me. That was one spent confined to bed, unable to breathe on my own, hooked up to machines, a tracheostomy tube in my neck, my arms curled up, my legs curled up. I lay there trapped inside my own body is really how it felt. I had two friends over. They came over all the time. They were from my church. My church family never forgot me. So while they were there, I still remember exactly what they were reading when all of a sudden um, I heard a booming authoritative loud voice over my shoulder over here say, my child, get up and walk. And there was nobody else in the room. And there was no one else in the room, and the door was over here. There were windows over this way. And instantly, I knew it was God. But instantly, I also knew that my friends didn't hear that, hmm. which is kind of interesting, too. Yeah. Um, and I needed to share with them what I heard. Well, I had this tracheostomy tube in my neck. That's how I breathed. And I had hands that did not work. So my friends said whenever I looked agitated, they knew I wanted to talk. So they'd come and plug the hole in my neck. And I said, I don't know what you're going to think about this, but God just told me to get up and walk. And my friends got really quiet. <laughs> I know, but he really did tell me to get up and walk. Run, get my family. I want them to be here. And um, my friends all of a sudden jumped up. And while they jumped, so did I. I was so excited, I couldn't wait for anyone. <laughs> And I literally jumped out of the bed. This, this is where you'd almost have to have known me to see how totally impossible that was. So this time, I remember reaching up and pulling my oxygen off my neck. I remember that. And then I jumped toward the voice. My friends are over here, but I jumped towards the voice. And as I jumped up, the first thing I remember isn't what I would think I would remember, but I jumped out of the bed and I looked and I saw my feet. They were flat on the ground just like everyone else's, which sounds normal, but not for me. I had foot drops so badly I couldn't even wear slippers on my feet. They were so curled. So when I jumped up to have feet flat, I was amazed and stood staring at my feet. And when I did that, I jumped like this, and then I saw my hands. And they were open, and they never opened. And so now they were open, and I stood staring at them, and then it dawned on me I could see me. That's what I would have thought I would have noticed mm. first was my vision. But I didn't. It I was noticed, back. You could see. It was back. I was perfectly fine. And I stood staring again for a little while, just feeling what it felt like to look at and see me. And then I turned. And that's when we were like women. We all started jumping up and down, screaming and thanking the Lord. I remember I didn't understand anything except where once I was real sick, I was well again. And it has to be God. That's all I knew. <laughs> And I want to quote to you what her physician wrote, quote, I have never witnessed anything like this before or since and considered it a rare privilege to observe the hand of God performing a true miracle. Barbara's account confirms to me that God still does supernatural work and begs me to revisit the most important miracle of all the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Why was Jesus of Nazareth crucified? Because he made outrageous claims about himself. He claimed to be the one and only Son of God. 
Why would anyone take his claim seriously? Well, that all depends. If Jesus actually rose from the dead, then his claim to be God's unique son carries considerable weight. On the other hand, if the resurrection never actually happened, then Jesus may be safely dismissed as just another interesting but tragic historical figure. Did Jesus rise from the dead? As we explore this question, we need to address two further questions. What are the facts that require explanation? And which explanation best accounts for these facts? There are three main facts that need to be explained. The discovery of Jesus' empty tomb, the appearances of Jesus alive after his death, and the disciples' belief that Jesus rose from the dead. Let's examine each of these. Fact number one. The discovery that Jesus' tomb was empty is reported in no less than six independent sources, and some of these are among the earliest materials to be found in the New Testament. This is important because when an event is recorded by two or more unconnected sources, historians' confidence that the event actually happened increases, and the earlier these sources are dated, the higher their confidence. Moreover, the Gospels indicate that it was women who first discovered that Jesus' body was missing. This is likely historical because in that culture, a woman's testimony was considered next to worthless. A later legend or fabrication would have had men make this discovery. Our confidence in the empty tomb is further increased by the response of the Jewish authorities. When they heard the report that the tomb was found empty, they said that Jesus' followers had stolen his body, thereby admitting that Jesus' tomb was, in fact, empty. Most scholars, by far, hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. Fact number two the appearances of Jesus alive after his death. In one of the earliest letters in the New Testament, Paul provides a list of witnesses to Jesus' resurrection appearances. He appeared to Peter, then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Finally, he appeared also to me. Furthermore, Various resurrection appearances of Jesus are independently confirmed by the Gospel accounts. On the basis of Paul's testimony alone, virtually all historical scholars agree that various individuals and groups experienced appearances of Jesus alive after his death. It may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Fact number three, the disciples' belief in the resurrection. After Jesus' crucifixion, his followers were devastated, demoralized, and hiding in fear for their lives. As Jews, they had no concept of a Messiah who would be executed by his enemies much less come back to life. The only resurrection Jews believed in was a universal event on Judgment Day after the end of the world, not an individual event within history. Moreover, in Jewish law, Jesus' crucifixion as a criminal meant that he was literally under God's curse. Yet somehow, despite all of this, the disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe that God had raised Jesus from the dead. They were so completely convinced that, when threatened with death, not one of them recanted. Even the Pharisee Paul, who persecuted Christians, suddenly became a Christian himself, as did Jesus' skeptical younger brother, James. Some sort of powerful, transformative experience is required to generate the sort of movement earliest Christianity was. That is why, as an historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. These three firmly established facts cry out for an adequate explanation. How do you make sense of them? 
Down through history, various naturalistic explanations have been offered to explain away these facts. The conspiracy hypothesis, the apparent death hypothesis, the hallucination hypothesis, and so on. All of these have been nearly universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The simple fact is that there is just no plausible naturalistic explanation of these three facts. The explanation given by the original eyewitnesses is that God raised Jesus from the dead. If it's even possible that God exists, then that explanation cannot be ruled out. For a God who is able to create the entire universe, the odd resurrection would be child's play. An empty tomb, Jesus' appearances alive after his death, and a group of dejected followers suddenly transformed by a radical new belief in a risen Messiah. These are independently established historical facts. How do you explain them? I hope that starting with this Easter, you will spend time to seek God and build a relationship with Him, our Savior and our Healer. For we have all sinned, and there is nothing that we can do to erase our sins. However, God has a plan for our salvation. God's plan centers on Jesus Christ, who came to earth, lived a sinless life, died on the cross as a sacrifice for humanity's sins and rose from the dead, conquering death. Through Jesus, God offers forgiveness, redemption, and eternal life to all who believe in him. We can choose to accept or reject this gift. Who could If you would like to accept God's gift of salvation, please pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge my sins and need for forgiveness. I repent and ask you to come into my life, to be my Savior and Lord. Thank you for dying for me and offering me salvation. Amen. Remember, it's not good people who goes to heaven, but forgiven people. If you can understand English, I recommend sound biblical teachings from Pastor Aaron of Calvary Chapel Foothill Ranch. K-Wave 107.9 is also a great resource. If you can only understand Vietnamese, I hope you will find a pastor who teaches through the Bible and relies on the word of God, not the wisdom of man. 
I know God loves you, and you will find Him if you diligently seek Him with all of your heart. And He will lead you to a church that can build up you up in the faith. Beware to not fall into cults or pastors who are wolves in sheep's clothing. You should always cross-check the pastor's sermon with the Word of God in the Bible. Also, gotquestions.org vid is also a great starting resource for your questions. Thank you to Daily Dose of Wisdom for raising my awareness about Barbara's condition and healing. And I first found um, out about this through this channel. Here is the link to Calvary Chapel Foothill Ranch. And this is gotquestions.org fit. Have a blessed Easter 2024.